today's guest is Amy Sprouse. So I had to ask Amy to be on the show. When I met her, I was going to do some filming for holistic health educators. By the way, if you, I get asked sometimes, like, who would you recommend if I want to learn more about nutrition or holistic health coaching? And I always send people to holistic health educators. They are mind blowingly amazing. Like you want to talk, learn everything you could ever want to know. They're just so thorough. So wonderful. Um, so Amy's mom, Karen Urbanek leads that up. And I'll put a link to that in the show notes. If you guys want to find out more about holistic health educators, but I was going to do some filming for them. Um, just sharing some of my, uh, lessons that I've learned as a coach, um, with their, crew and Amy just blew me away. I was like, who is, who are you? <laughs> you are so knowledgeable. I feel like you could hang with any naturopathic doctor or functional medicine doctor. I know like she's so knowledgeable. Um, and it's, I mean, it's no surprise. She grew up in this world. Right. And she's just super, super bright. You guys will see. Um, so she is obviously a holistic health coach. She's part of holistic health educators. She's also a CrossFit coach, which is pretty cool. And she's, um, a physiology instructor for holistic health educators. And she's also currently Currently going to Johns Hopkins to study public health reform. So we get into that. We got into some Rona stuff, which was pretty cool. Um, just her sharing some of the physiology stuff behind um, vaccines and the virus itself. And just some of her thoughts on that, which I found very impacting for me personally. Um, and yeah, Amy, she is just like literally a ray of sunshine embodied in human form. Um, that is also really, 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 really smart. <laughs> I feel like that's a pretty accurate uh, description. So I think you guys are going to love this episode. She's so fun to listen to. She's such a great teacher and um, she's just so bright and has so many wonderful things to say about health. So let's dive into all things holistic health with Amy Sprouse. All right. I am super excited to just dive in with you, Amy. I like when we talked last time, I was like, I wish people could just be a fly on the wall in this conversation because it's so cool. And just a little background. I met you because you reached out to me about holistic health educators, which has just completely blown me away. And as we were talking, as I was visiting down at your mom's house in, in Cedar City, I was like, you know, I, I could immediately tell you knew your stuff and health. I was like, whoa, like, this woman is super educated. And then you told me you were, you were attending Johns Hopkins right now in public health reform. And I was like, okay, hold on. We got to get you on the podcast because as I mentioned, before we started talking, it's super awesome to have somebody that's highly educated on what health actually is actually diving into that and letting people know and getting into the reform and changes that need to happen. So can you share a little bit about this disconnect that you see here between the people who know and the people making the policies? Yeah. So that's funny. Cause you're like, Oh, it's so good to have someone highly educated on how to actually be health operating in that field. And it is also a recipe to go insane in case anyone's wow. wondering, like if you feel wow. like going crazy, just, but a lot okay. of people actually feel that way. A lot of people who care about like holistic health and preventative medicine and um, empowering people with the tools they can to not only manage their disease, but reverse it. A lot of people with those core foundational beliefs struggle working in an institutionalized medical environment because of obvious reasons. It's not how the system is set up um, from the ground up. I have recently heard a quote that I really liked, actually. Someone was talking about the some of the problems with the judicial system, which is often known as one of the more, one of the areas that needs a lot of reform mm -hmm. in our country. And uh, they're saying like the system's not broken. It's working exactly how it was designed to be a profitable system that wow. keeps people in prison and in jails and making Whoa. money as long as possible. They're like, the system's not broken. It's working exactly as it was wow. designed. And Oof. after I heard that, I was like, whoa, this is really interesting. Cause instead of me looking at healthcare through that lens of like, mm. oh, the system's broken. I'm like, this is how we train our, our medical and public health professionals from day one. Like this wow. is so that for all yeah. intents and purposes, like if we're looking at the system being broken, like this is exactly how it's been planned from the ground Oof. up is like <clears throat> from the time these people want a little girl grows up and wants to be a nurse or me grows up and wants to work in public health because I care about preventative medicine. And I'm going to tell you some really cool public health stories because I am so mm. passionate about public health. But like you have these people who have this passion to work in the healthcare field and actually help people feel healthy again. And then they enter the system and you're like, whoa, like this is not what I thought I was signing up yeah. for, you know? And so this is actually why I'm really hopeful about the future of healthcare in our country, because when you have this many people who are passionate about actually helping people get healthy on the inside, who are so upset with how things are happening right now, 
Like I guarantee you doctors wish they had more liberty in how they could treat clients. Like I guarantee you, they don't pull out their clipboard and they're like, I'm just going to make money and on my pharmaceutical drugs today. Like they have protocols they need to follow that are given to them by their insurance companies. Like they look at your insurance first. That's the, that's, what's going to determine like what kind of protocol they give people. And so I'm just saying, um, uh, there's a lot of really awesome opportunities where like even minor adjustments would actually make huge impacts. Um, but Yeah, for me, public health is awesome because it's the whole concept of trying to prevent negative health outcomes from happening in the first place. That's like the goal of public health. So like in the medical field, you tend to work with people very one-on-one. In public health, you uh, look at the population as a whole and you may make policies that range from, or or any kind of health um, program with the community that ranges from doing like a diabetes prevention program all the way to like planting more trees because the more trees there are in a community, the less crime rate there is because it doesn't get as hot and there's better air quality and it just keeps the calm. It's better for people's mental health. Like that, that's like wow. the range of public health. There's such a variety. Anyway, you can perk up. I want to, I want to, I want to give the audience a little bit of background on you so they know where you're coming from, because I, when I was in, and I'm about to interview your mom, Karen Urbanek right after this. And, and, and so you guys will get to see like some background for Amy's life. Cause when I was at your house that you grew up with, with your mom, I'm like, wow, you didn't grow up in the typical, you know, standard American diet, frozen burrito, take your Tylenol life. You grew up in holistic health. Like that was what was normal to you. I remember you saying like, I didn't know it wasn't normal to just like, if you get a cold, you just use steam and like natural remedies to be able to get better, take vitamins and eat healthy and get fresh air and drink good water, you know? Um, and so you, you grew up in this amazing environment. I mean, your, your mom had a, a cafe and health centers. And so from a young age, you were in this world, but then you went on to study epidemiology. I'm curious what, you know, where, what happened inside of you to be like, okay, <laughs> I got to go deeper and get into public health. Can you give us some background on what that journey was like for you? Yes, I love that question. So growing up, I saw my mom's like, we had a mom and pop shop for all intents and purposes. Yeah. We, had, we were the first organic non-GMO grocery store in all of Wisconsin. Nice. And so, and we were out, we were like 20 miles out in the middle of nowhere. My friends would <laughs> call it driving to Jesus, no man's land to get to where we lived. <laughs> we lived out in the middle of nowhere, have this organic grocery store, start hosting these classes on disease prevention. And like, of course, half the town, I don't know what percent of the town actually was like, they're crazy. And then other people are like, wow, this is so fascinating. Like there's more options, you know, than what yeah. I could build. So we yeah. started like teaching all this stuff. And I was like, wow, I love what my mom's doing. Yeah. Um, and there needs to be like 50,000 more of her everywhere, <laughs> you know? Yeah. So that's where I was like, okay. I was like, I could work with my mom. Cause people are like, are you going to continue your mom's business? And I'm like, I'm going straight up to policy, man. Like what yeah. my mom's doing here, like empowering people with, with how they can manage their diseases and reverse their diseases from mm-hmm. home. And like, mm-hmm. not that like we have any right to modify people's medications, but if they want to get off their medications, you bet your bottom dollar, you can affect <laughs> your me- medicational protocol. And so they mm-hmm. were, she was doing all this stuff in the community and I loved it. And I was like, this needs to happen at a national scale or at least a state level scale. Like this needs to happen yeah. at a larger scale. So I was like, oh, I want to get into policy because that would make sense. Right. To right. try to help expand this field more. And so um, I loved get, studying epidemiology. It's the statistical use statistics to study the cause and spread of diseases and health behaviors and trends in populations. And so that there's so many times that we we like think things are, we've always heard of it, like things are associated or they're correlated, but that doesn't mean they're causative. So using a statistical approach really helps you get to the bottom level of things. I realized after I started studying like uh, social determinants of health and more about epidemiology, there's so much more that goes into whether or not someone can be healthy than just their education, um, just how much they know about health. Right. Have you ever heard of food deserts? I haven't. So a food desert is an example of um, when we, so one thing we'll do in statistics is plot where all the grocery stores are in a city and people's access to those grocery stores. Because if you have someone Mm -hmm. who doesn't have a car who lives in a poor region of town, they might only have uh, Little Caesars Pizza and a 7-Eleven and another uh, gas station and then a KFC. Like literally yeah. that might be their food options. And right. so if they're, if they're not gonna pay money to go take a taxi to go to the grocery store or they don't wanna carry their groceries for two miles, we call that a food desert. Cause wow. at that point it wouldn't matter if you came in and uh, if you came in and ran a 
educational program for diabetes. Right. You right. know, it wouldn't matter if you're like, you guys, you got to buy your vegetables because there's like right. no vegetables for them to buy. <laughs> so a public health policy there would be like, um, oh, here's a vacant plot of land. Let's give this grocery store a tax break to move in and make healthy food more accessible to these Love people. It. Awesome. Yeah. So that's like, that's what got me. Yeah. I'm so happy to ask this question. Cause you're like reminding me, you're reminding yeah. me like why I love public health. Cause it's smart. You look at like all the data yeah. and you're like, you look at what's the bottom line between someone not being able to reach their health goals. And there's never a bottom line. It's usually like seven things and it's really complex and you have to network together and access to healthcare is a really big determinant as well. So I'm not mm-hmm. anti access mm-hmm. healthcare. Like people should go get screened for things and they can right. go get a professional opinion where I draw the line is you don't have to do what they say but take mm-hmm. advantage of the advancements we have in medical diagnostic tools, you know, and yeah, then after that, okay. after that, realize you are empowered to make your own decisions after, after yeah. you get that professional opinion. But that's what got me into public health is because I wanted to do like a more bird's eye view um, when it comes to public health initiatives. I love it. It's, it's like, instead of just complaining about the way things are, it's like, well, let's dive in, let's start making actual changes and supporting people and being able to achieve these goals that they read about or hear about online and that are totally unrealistic for them. It's like, well, let's provide solutions. Yes. yes. Yeah. It's yeah, awesome. And a, lot of, a lot of people don't even know like what public health is like before the pandemic, especially now people think <laughs> we're not going to talk about the perception of public health right now. Cause it's not designed. <laughs> it's not meant to be a dictatorship. Mm. It's not not meant to disempower people. It's not meant to take away your power or put you in fear or give you a list of five things that you think are your only options of how to be a healthy person that aren't even accurate guidelines for how to be a healthy person. That's not like the, that's not like true. That's not the true essence of public health. You know, mm. sometimes there will be policies like, you know, like we might like, like water sanitation, you know, like we'll have set guidelines for like water right. sanitation and air cleanliness, but it's all about empowering people. That's the essence mm. of public health and like helping them have access to the tools they need to be healthy. Mm. Okay. So you mentioned that you had some stories about public health reform that might be interesting. Can you, can you enlighten us about what's going on in, in public health um, from a story perspective? Definitely. So I actually like to separate public health into two different categories. At this point, we have public health that's happening by public health institutions. And Mm. then I would put quotes around public health when I say that, by the way. And (laughs) then we have public health that's happening with like a private sector or individual businesses or freelance people or grassroots movements. And I don't mean to just put quotes Uh, public health institutions do a lot of amazing good, but there's very very different flavors of public health, like very different flavors. One is a lot about increasing access to medical services, increasing screenings, very important. Like the earlier you get diagnosed with something, the better. So I'm like all for that, you know, increase, increase screenings, increase access. Um, They have lots of vaccination campaigns, lots of, uh, um, uh, really great collaborative projects to work on like opioid over overuse and all that. And so that's one flavor of public health. You have another flavor of public health that approaches things from the perspective of the best way to reform a system is actually just to replace it with something better <laughs> instead of yep. like trying to go yep. in and like it's going in and totally. Being like, <laughs> we should insert some health information here. Exactly. You know? It's like, you know, we're just going to create a better alternative. And so exactly. that's what, like, that's the part that gets me excited is because yeah. then it's not about like, just trying to be like, fix something the whole time. It's just like, Hey, what's the ideal solution here? If we can create this in our society, like it's going to, it's going to phase out whatever was less efficient eventually yeah. if, if it can yeah. be created. So that's definitely like the strong, that's like definitely my preference when it comes to public health. And that's what I'm, it is weird world working between these two worlds, but it's also very exciting because I do have my hand in a lot of this flavor of public health. We're like, that's exactly what we're doing with our school is like, I would get so frustrated about like, oh, they're not teaching any practical applications of human anatomy and physiology in our health courses. You know, like for example, right. like I'll go through, learn all these in, like incredible details about the digestive tract system and they won't teach you a thing about nutrition or I'll learn all this stuff about immunology and they won't tell you anything about how that relates to the development of autoimmune disorders in our today's society or even how to keep your lymph system healthy. But we know all the details, like we know all the mechanisms, we know all wow. the science, but there's no practical, I shouldn't say no, right. very little practical application. So instead right. of me just like getting so huffy puffy about it. Mm-hmm. I have this school where I'm like building out the most incredible anatomy and physiology course that I think it, I'm totally biased, but like 
I am putting my heart and soul into this thing. It's called Practical Applications of Anatomy, of Human Anatomy mm-hmm. and Physiology. And I'm taking like all this, my favorite science that I've learned from over here. And now yeah. I'm piecing in all this holistic health information. So it's awesome. like, oh, you know, for example, oh, you know, your stomach cells need acetylcholine to bind to them to trigger the release of stomach acid. And that's why acetylcholine is the dominant neurotransmitter when you're in rest and digest. Norepinephrine is the dominant neurotransmitter when you're in fight or flight. That's why if you eat when you're stressed out, you won't be producing enough stomach acid. You'll get heartburn and your digestive tract's not going to be operating properly because your whole digestive tract needs acetylcholine in order to work properly. And so that would be like a practical application, you know, when you're studying neurotransmitters. So that's the stuff that I want to bring into health education. So that's my like renewed hope right now is like, you know what, yeah. if we hate the current insurance system, yep. let's phase it out with something better. If we totally if upset that our health education system is like fundamentally lacking basic health information, let's create a new health education system, you know? And so yeah. that's kind of like, th- those are the two different flavors of public health in case you're curious. Yeah, no, I, it's so well said. And that's what I say all the time. I'm like, that's why I love business. I, I tell my kids, I'm like, if you really want to change the world, you do with your business, right? You present a better option and people just go that way. It's, it's pretty simple. And the old giant dinosaurs just crumble and fall to the ground because pe- the, the business and the money are starting to go different ways. Now, Now, so now we've looked at it from two ways because it's like, okay, well, it's helpful to have some government involvement when there can be a grocery store put on this plot of land, like you mentioned, right. And helping people out from that way. And then we have this other side where it's like, okay, well, if you really want to get educated about your health, probably not going to go to like foodpyramid.gov, you know, or like some of these Mm -hmm. resources. So, you know, it's an interesting conversation because I know that most of us in the health optimization world, we've kind of, it's, it's, it's honestly, it's kind of an anti-government world. It's kind of like, we're kind of angry, you know, it's kind of this, like, look, look what's happening to human health as a result of what the government's putting out, but it's like, okay, well, can we hold, can we, we, you know, put our guns down, put our swords down for a second and breathe and, and, and present to the world, the things that will help and support from, from a business standpoint, from an education standpoint, but how can we still, you know, I guess what I'm asking is how can we kind of mend our relationship and give support to the government side of health, you know, like enlighten, enlighten us a little bit about some of the more good that is happening from that end of things too. You know, like what are some other things that, because I find gratitude is, can be very healing, you know, and it's like, Hey, you know, I always say like, thank you for taking care of the roads and filtering, well, sort of filtering the water (laughs) that I then have two other filters that I add on, on top of that. (laughs) Thanks for the head start. You know, what are some other things that we can be grateful for that, that are integrated, at least in the United States, at least in our, in our country from more of the, you know, institutional side of things? Yeah, definitely. Well, I'm happy you asked that because one thing that keeps me going uh, is just remembering that every system we're talking about is run by people at the end of the day. And so it's like really easy to get frustrated at systems. Mm -hmm. Um, But usually like when you meet the people inside the systems, you're like, wow, these are like 99% good, (laughs) you know? Mm -hmm. And so um, that's why I'm a, I'm just like a big fan of collaborating as much as possible. Yeah. Like I really, like, I love how you said, put your guns down. Um, it's like a daily meditation for me. I bet. I bet. That'd be a very <laughs> tough position to be in. Yeah. You're very educated on what is actually needed in health. And then you're seeing all this, you know, kind of corruption and the, and the money well, if, and the big if, pharma and all if, this stuff. Like if I can hard. give you an example of why this bothers me so much, I live in a community which has some of the worst health statistics of the whole state, which has some of the, the local population has some of the worst health statistics of the whole nation actually. And so like there's dialysis centers going up, like almost like every few, I don't know what the exact increment is like, quarter every few weeks around here. It just seems like dial- kidney disease, liver diseases, in diabetes. Hawaii, right? Yeah. In Hawaii. Um, mm-hmm. there's just a lot of health conditions that are like very obviously a problem. And what's the disc, the biggest disconnect for me is like with the COVID pandemic right now, like it'll make the news, this will blow your mind. It makes the news like the unvaccinated cost the U.S. healthcare system two billion dollars in June and July of tw- 2021. I was like hmm, two billion dollars, huh? So I just like did my research and like you total U.S. healthcare expenditure is three point eight trillion dollars a year. So if you like, I looked up like they they publish how much 
like the U S hospitals spend quarterly by month by month, everything time period. I just like looked at all the numbers and I was like, this is far less than 1% of total U S healthcare expenditure, far less than 1% wow. is the, wow. is the burden that the unvaccinated are placing on the U S healthcare system. And wow. what percentage of our news and public health attention is it getting right now? That's what's unethical. Crazy. It's Crazy. not just the fact that the the vaccine has no long-term safety and efficacy data, which is like, I'm mind blown. I'm mind right. blown. Anyone who's ever given a shit about the scientific method thinks it makes sense to mandate something with no long-term science, like right. safety or efficacy data, because just for the records, and we'll get into the vaccine later, but anyway, so that the ethics of that aside, totally. The fact that we're disproportionately spending our attention on something that's costing less than 1% of total U.S. healthcare expenditure. Meanwhile, the people in my own community are being cut off from vital resources like community and restaurants and things like this over this over this thing, and they're dying of all these other diseases. You look at the rates of heart disease, diabetes, mental health, suicide, opioid overdose, um, uh, like just coronary heart disease, all of these things over the pandemic. Like this is a letter that I actually wrote my institution because I was like, this is my issue. Like, I don't want to withdraw wow. from this program. I want to be here, but I am not being honest with you right now. Yeah. This is an ethical dilemma that so I'm good. spending all of my class time talking about how to push a vaccine that doesn't even have long-term safety or efficacy data when it's less than 1% of our actual problems in this country. Wow. Wow. Yeah. So it sounds like, I mean, Ha, huh. it's, it's first I commend you for like, like going in the, <laughs> in my opinion, like the hornet's nest yeah. <laughs> of like really try. I'm like, okay, I'm going to try. But like, like really what I'm hearing from you is like the solutions, what you were saying before this, we're going to have to provide a better solution instead of trying to, you know, take our little wooden stick and fight the giant with it. It's yeah. like, how about we just create a whole new innovation system that provides solutions because the other system is just not, you said, even from the beginning designed to get us where we're trying to go. We're, we're, yeah. 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 Um, and, oh, you can go, but there's well, one more thing I want to say that's yeah, more no. hopeful. It's like slightly more hopeful. <laughs> <laughs> um, but like, even within the system, there are some tweet, there are some adjustments we can make that would make a huge difference because actually us healthcare is awesome. Like we have great access to like phenomenal tools, phenomenal standards of care. Like us healthcare is, is, um, it's very inefficient cost-wise, but mm -hmm. a lot yeah. of it's really good. And so just like statistically speaking. And so if we can, uh, while we're doing all these grassroots movements and finding better solutions on our own, which honestly, like you and I are both health coaches. That's really what I think America needs right now is like right. a whole team of highly educated, specialized health coaches going out and helping people make individualized change. That is what I believe will be like the saving grace totally. of this nation is health coaching. So that's why totally. I'm so happy to be working in this field where I get to train health coaches for a living. It's so fulfilling. Totally. It's, a, it's the ripple effect. You train a health coach or you train your clients and they're right. going to affect the way they parent their children, the way they interact totally. with the rest of their life, the way they take care of themselves. That is, in my opinion, the long-term solution to our debilitating healthcare crisis, where we have this huge aging population. One thing we look at in public health is population dynamics. We have this huge aging population. All these baby boomers are retiring and they're going to be a mm -hmm. huge burden on the, not trying to talk about them like a burden, but there's going to be a huge burden placed on the healthcare system coming up in the years ahead. And I'm just wondering like why we keep talking about expanding healthcare without talking about how to reverse disease. Like we can't, we cannot right. accommodate the aging right. population of our current model. So like, how come none of us are talking about how to reverse disease? Right. It's like, it's like throwing a giant, you know, a pile of garbage in your yard and you're, you just keep doing, I'm not, not trying to call baby. <laughs> I'm not relating to that. I'm it's talking about problem, diseases. Though. Yeah. Yeah. I'm saying, yeah. But like throwing this big pile of garbage in your yard, and, and all you're thinking about is solutions on how to clean it up instead of th throwing the pile out. Like, why it, are we yes. keep putting it there? You know? And so, yeah, I, like, I want to dive in with you because you have such a sound understanding of the human body. Like it would be a travesty to not get some of that out, especially in light of, I would say the biggest crisis in human health that we have seen in our lifetime and probably in a very, very long time. And that is the lack of education on how we can be healthy in the first place to prevent ourselves from dying of disease, including viruses. Right. And so I love what you're saying. Cause you know, obviously I follow a lot of health accounts on social media and it's just so awesome to see this like team of educators, like so many of us helping and saying, listen, like get your vitamin D levels checked. Like, do you see the correlation with negative outcomes and vitamin D? And so, um, I would love to hear your opinions one on things we can do proactively with health to be, I mean, 
healthier in the face of COVID, but obviously healthier in general, but specifically in the face of COVID, like things that are big hitters for you. And then I'd also love to hear your thoughts on the vaccine and all that. (laughs) Yeah, definitely. Very happy to share that. Um, yeah. So when it comes to, um, the human body and, uh, I'm actually taking a really, really good immunology course right now from Hopkins. It's kicking my butt. Actually, it's probably going to end up being the hardest class I've ever taken in Mm. all of like my schooling. Mm. Um, I forgot to read the prerequisites before I enrolled in it. I was like, oh, I love studying immunology, you know? And so I I want to learn more. (laughs) So I enrolled in it. And the fourth lecture was like the day after the drop deadline. I wouldn't have dropped it anyway, because I like I love (laughs) challenges, but I read I like the fourth lecture. I was like, what did I sign up for? (laughs) But um yeah, this is it's really empowering to know how your body's designed to work because it removes so much fear from the situation. Yeah. You know, it removes a lot of fear to know, like your body's designed to be so unbelievably kick ass. It blows my mind. If you knew like what your immunoglobulins and your T cells were doing on a daily basis, both your innate and adaptive immune system were doing 24 seven around the clock. Oh, you have like a little, you have, oh, this is a cute example of a pathogen. Okay. So you have this like little pathogen that like comes into your body and you have your first level of your immune response, which is your innate immune response. And that's less specific. That just is like, oh, there's something here that shouldn't be here. Let's start firing up our immune cells to start, you know, eating away at it and start, uh, inducing uh, temporary inflammation, you need inflammation so yeah. that the bigger cells, the macrophages and, you know, cinephils can come in and kind of do their work. That's why you get inflammation. You need the working space to like yeah. conduct warfare. And so, you, <laughs> you know, it induces inflammation. You have cytokines that start being released so that they can start seeing, um, you know, what they're looking for these receptor sites are called epitopes on the outside of this bacteria or virus or whatever it is. And so then you, now you, your adaptive immune system starts kicking in and that usually takes a few days. And so now you have these more specific things that are looking at how to bind to these different epitopes sticking out of this, out of this virus or, or parasite or whatever it is. And then they are like literally making like thousands and thousands, if not millions of different, like things trying to lock and key, trying to find the right one. And as soon as it finds it, then it's like, hey, you guys, we found what's going to bind to this. You're going to have your immunoglobulin bind to this or your T cell bind to this. And that's going to recruit other things in the immune system to come gobble it up. And then that little uh, lock and key guy, your body remembers that. That's what an antibody is, are your immunoglobulins. And so it's like, oh, I know if I attach here, I'm going to recruit a big white blood cell. It's going to gobble up and we'll be good. Mm -hmm. So that's how it's designed to work. So your body's doing that like 24 seven around the clock. And sometimes we get swollen lymph nodes because when you have an underlying infection, your body is producing billions of extra immune cells. So you get, it's swollen because there's a lot going on there. Um, And a big important part of the immune system is it needs to be your lymphatic system is what carries these immune cells throughout your body, as well as some in your bloodstream. Your body needs to be flowing because as soon as this antibody is discovered, it needs to, that recipe needs to travel around the rest of your body to educate the rest of your body on Mm. how to make it right. So Mm. if it's like, maybe this lymph node, maybe this area discovers how to attack that. I need to get that information to like my foot until, you know, so this virus is circulating, my whole body knows how to fight it. So I explain that because movement and mobility with the exception of people who are dealing with like a chronic, well, here's the hard part. People who have underlying infectious diseases like mold toxicity, Epstein-Barr virus, well, we all have Epstein-Barr virus, but if it gets like out of whack, um, um, Lyme disease, um, uh, there's another really big one that's really common. Um, but we have, we have some of these like chronic underlying infections for these people, movement will be very uncomfortable because the viruses and pathogens often hang out in their joints and deep in their fascia. And it makes it very uncomfortable to move. They'll feel very lethargic after they move. But if you have someone who's not to that point yet, moving the body to get your lymph, actually, even those people, you have to get your lymph flowing. That's the biggest thing. Your lymph fluid needs to flow. And I can't tell people enough, like, of course, nutrition matters. Take your herbs, take your vitamin D, blah, 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 do it. But like our paleolithic ancestors used to walk 15 miles a day 
if you are not moving your body, like I don't care how many yeah. nutrients you're consuming, yeah. like you yeah. need that movement, get into downward dog, stretch, release the fascia, open up this whole fascia yeah. line, like, and, and, and go upside down. And like, mm-hmm. anyway, so that would be the first thing is generating internal movement. And the second thing is your upper respiratory tract. That's another and reason. Real quick. I just want to interject your yeah. lymphatic system does not have muscles. It doesn't, it doesn't contract itself. So that's why Amy's saying you have to move if you want your lymph to flow. Okay. Yes. All right. Yes. Let's up a respiratory. No, yeah. Thank you. It Dive doesn't in. have its own pump. It like you are right. its only pump. And actually this is another thing. If you have people who are sick or bedridden, you can help them move, jiggle their feet, come on the ends of their feet and just pulse them yeah. or like Love swing that. their feet over to the side and move them for them. Love I know that. that sounds silly and small, but like people need to move. Mm-hmm. And so I always mm-hmm. give the stagnant pond analogy. Like this right. is why hydration is so important. Like, do you want your, we're all bodies of water. Like there's bodies right. of water, like oceans and ponds and streams. There's also bodies of water that are us. Right. If you want, do you want your body of water to be like a stagnant pond where all the oxygen's used up and there's like algae growing on top? Or do you want it to be like a rushing Alaskan river? You know, Love so it's it. like, that's like the analogy you have to be thinking of about the food right. in your body. Like, do you want it flowing and, and rush and, and, and cleansing your lymphatic systems every single night coming through your muscles and washing it, it bathes it and it collects Love the it. dead cells and the pathogens. And it uses that to educate itself, but also to flush it out of the body. So, so this is happening all the time. And so you want that to happen anyway. Um, second thing, and then I'll be done from like the immune system, upper respiratory tract part. The uh, upper respiratory tract doesn't get talked about enough because what we've seen in a lot of COVID patients is actually, it's not the viral infection that causes them the most damage. It's the secondary bacterial, I shouldn't say the most damage. The virus can do a lot of things inside the body, but what causes the worst symptoms for a lot of people is the secondary bacterial infection. So what happens is you have the virus comes in, it it drops down and it comp- it starts to compromise your epithelial tissue in your throat. And so the epithelial tissue is the first lining of your um, immune system. <clears throat> you have it like under your skin and everything. Um, and so it starts to wear that down. And then you have bacteria from your upper sinus that drops down and infects the area and inflames it. And that causes a lot of pain for people. Um, and so people develop these secondary bacterial infections and that's why they administer antibiotics when you go to the hospital for COVID right away, because, um, they'd want to decrease the secondary bacterial infection. That's actually really common for almost all viral infections. Anytime you compromise the immune system, you're going to have candida getting out of whack, bacteria getting out of whack. Like it's, the immune system, like how many can it manage at a single time? And so mm-hmm. you get this bacterial infection. So this is why I've been telling people from day one, like you need to be practicing nose breathing right, all day long. Keep your mouth closed. Like, tape right. your mouth shut at night if you have to. Practice nose breathing. If anyone's read the book Breath by James Nestor, mm-hmm. it's phenomenal. Have you read that one? I, I haven't. I've heard it, had it recommended a million times, but I heard a, a breath expert go into detail about the cleansing effect of breathing through your nose, not to mention the parasympathetic nervous system yes. reaction that happens, but I'll let you dive into it. And, no, and totally. Us. And I hope I'm not like talking too much right now. No, I love <laughs> but, it. Keep going. Okay. Well, yeah. So when you're nose breathing, first of all, it is cleaning out a lot of the pathogens, just the getting that airflow. They've done so many studies on people who knows breathe versus not, and the pathogenic load of these people's upper respiratory tract. Just so everyone knows the upper oh, cool. respiratory tract, think of it from like your throat up and your lower respiratory tract is from your throat down. So your nice. lungs are part of your lower respiratory tract, your sinuses and your nose and your nasal passageways. Wow. That's part of your upper respiratory tract and above your larynx. And so um, you want to be practicing nose breathing and be cleaning out a lot of these um, bacteria and, and, uh, and, and viruses. You want to be practicing that. I swim in the ocean. So I get like a, a nature version of a neti pot, like every yeah. other day, like yeah. just cleaning yeah. out all the time. So going for walks, practicing nose breathing, that's going to be huge. Cause if you can decrease the load up here, you're going to have a less propensity for this to develop in a secondary Love bacterial it. infection. That's the first thing. The second thing you said is the parasympathetic state. So everyone's heard of like fight or flight or rest and digest when you're in fight or flight, your body releases cortisol, which as can be great for you in, in short doses. Like right. cortisol definitely plays a role in human health. Like at my personality right. type definitely needs cortisol. That's why I love high intensity interval training. Like it does right. great things for me in short bursts, but right. it is an immunosuppressant. And so your body is not going to be telling your, your T cells and your immunoglobulins to be focusing on creating antibodies. If you're like running away from a bear, you have other priorities right. at the time than like, right. then, right. then your innate and adaptive of immune system going to work. So cortisol suppresses your immune system. And what we often see is that when people come out the other end of very stressful events, that's when they get sick. Like a lot of stressful things will happen and then they'll finally start to relax. And then boom, they get sick as a 
uh, what's sick? What's really sick these days? I was going to say like a fat duck, but that is- <laughs> <laughs> We'll go with that. <laughs> anyway, they just get so sick after that. And that's because finally their body- is getting out of fight or flight, the cortisol stopping released. And we often see a reverse spike in, in immune response because it's wow. been suppressed this whole time. So now we have this overreaction wow. and then they finally yeah. come down. So if you ever notice that in people, like they'll get done with something stressful and then they'll get sick. Yeah. Right. And, and, and so, if you look at it from like an autoimmune and since you see so often this chronic high cortisol, high blood sugar, adrenal, adrenal mode, uh, rushing woman syndrome, as Dr. Mindy Pels was telling us about a few episodes ago, this like chronic high cortisol, you see that often go even into like autoimmune. That's a, a pattern I've noticed a lot in people. So it makes sense even on the short term where you're saying that like overreaction of the immune system when you've been suppressed from having high cortisol all the time. Yeah. 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 Totally, totally. Okay. Tell we us, should, we, should, we should do a separate call on autoimmune disorders. Cause it's so interesting. By the way, if you're like majorly geeking out on Amy, now you can see why I had to have her on the podcast. Like Amy's part of holistic health educators. That's that's, that's how we met. So I'll put resources for that. If you're like hearing this and you're like, I want to learn all this stuff. This is freaking awesome. Holistic health educators is who I am recommending to people to get educated about holistic health. So I'll put links to that in the yeah, show notes as well. Yeah. Okay. Let's talk about, um, I'm just curious your thoughts on the vaccine. <laughs> yeah. So, <clears throat> so I, I'll preface putting you on the spot. <laughs> no, you're totally fine. I love talking about it. Um, okay. I'll preface this by saying I'm at, I'm not an anti-vaxxer like to begin mm-hmm. with. Like I don't Me agree neither. with the I don't agree with the CDC schedule. Like there's no way I am pumping that many foreign substances into my newborn child that on quickly. The schedule, that quickly right. on the schedule right. they have designed. But that said, so I might not be following, I won't be following their schedule for it. Yeah. But I still there's several vaccinations I do believe in because totally. it is the idea of you do get to you get to introduce to the body just enough of that pathogen to right. elicit that immunoglobulin and right. response I was talking about. Right. Um so I just need to say that. Now my qualms with what's going on right now <laughs> okay, so first of all, the clinical studies were done on how well the vaccine attenuates your symptoms when you get COVID. So I just want to make that clear. Everyone thinks it was done on how well it decreases transmission. It was done on how well it will decrease how bad someone gets COVID when they get COVID. Okay, mm-hmm. just so we all know that's what the clinical studies mm-hmm. were done on. Now we can assume that if someone has less severe symptoms and they're caught, they're expecting less into the air, they're coughing less, they're sneezing yeah. less, they're going to transmit less. You know, those right. those two correlations are like right next to each other. The less someone's mm-hmm. coughing and sneezing, ideally mm-hmm. the less they're going to be transmitting the disease. Mm-hmm. But I just have to start off by clarifying that because one thing that bogs bog bugs me to no end is people calling people who are choosing to be unvaccinated selfish. Right. Because I'm like, I'm not sure if you completely, you, I mean, we've all had the science, the biggest, one of the biggest sources of misinformation to me right now are the people who are supposed to be providing us with reliable, reliable health information, because yeah. whoever yeah. was interpreting these clinical studies didn't actually make it clear. This is designed to make it less worse for you when you get it. Okay. Right. Anyway, right. That said, I'm not saying it doesn't lead to decreasing transmission because that can, but that's what the clinical right. research were done on. Anyway. So, um, there's that to consider. The second thing, um, I actually thought it was like, when I first heard the concept of an MRNA vaccine or a jab, we should call it. I was like, whoa, that's very like fascinating. Whoever thought of like hijacking my body's ribosomes to produce a virus, like that's very creative. You know, Mm -hmm. it's very creative. That said, I personally do not want my ribosomes making anything other than Amy Sprouse's beautiful body. And that's just a personal belief system I have. I believe that my body is designed to take care of itself. And I do not want my ribosomes manufacturing. Oh, in case anyone's wondering, um, your DNA gets transcribed into RNA, which gets sent to your ribosomes, which makes proteins in your body. So that's the whole process. DNA turns to messenger RNA, which takes the coding to the ribosome, which is a protein factory in each of your cells. So anyway, I just don't want my ribosomes producing proteins that aren't, that don't belong to my body. That's just a personal yeah. belief system I have though. So anyway, you can take that for what you want. Um, uh, in terms of whether or not people want to participate in the vaccine, because the research we have right now on how well it is attenuating symptoms and decreasing transmission is very promising. Um, a lot of the, well, assuming the data we're looking at is accurate, which like mm-hmm. that's a whole nother conversation. <laughs> I stopped believing the majority of COVID data yeah. a long time ago, but um, yeah. 
anyway, but like we do have really promising data on um, on symptom attenuation and on on and hospitalization differences between people who are vaccinated and unvaccinated. So that that's really good. You know, I really hope I I really hope that it's not as bad as um we hope it's not as bad as it yeah. as, as it could be. You know, that's what right. I'm saying. You know? Right. That said, sometimes um my biggest qualm with there being no long-term safety or efficacy data is like sometimes things like flu shots can have reverse efficacy because the first year that it's introduced, it's based off of the relevant strains in that are circulating at that time. And so like we've seen this with certain flu vaccines where the first year someone gets a flu vaccine and I've never been a big fan of flu vaccines, but anyway, um, it might decrease their likelihood of getting sick, but sometimes it can actually increase their likelihood of contracting the flu the next couple of years after that. We call it reverse efficacy efficacy because their body didn't naturally go through the immune response and, and, and the natural way of creating um, those antibodies. And so it ends up having reverse efficacy. And that's just what I hope doesn't happen with something like this, where like yeah. it gets, we get down the road and right. all of a sudden we're like, oh, wow, this actually increases your propensity to have right. whatever the variant of coronavirus is going to be three years from now, because it's going to keep on mutating. Yeah. Thank you for sharing all that. I'm reading, uh, Dr. Bruce Lipton's the biology of belief right now. I don't know if you've read that, but really, really going into the proteins and the cell membrane. And so I'm very aligned with that with you and it's tough. It's a tough thing right now because there's a huge education component, um, deeper education that has to be in place to understand why a lot of us don't want to get the vaccine. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of a long conversation sometimes. And so I, I appreciate you educating and sharing some of those deeper reasons why you don't want it. Um, all right. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to wrap up and I, but I, before I do, I just, I, I just would love if you could share, like when I went and met you down at your mom's house, like I was just, I was so inspired by one, the vibration and energy that I felt from you guys. It's a, it's a higher level vibration, which to me, that is health. When I see that level of vibration, like this, just this happiness, freedom, um, it's, at, it, there's no way to put words to it. It's really, it's just an energy. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, at, for at risk of, you know, asking you a, a question that the answer is really like <laughs> years long, I would love if you could share just some of the, the, the most important lifestyle components of being on this higher vibration. Like, what does that look like? You know, if you can, sometimes it's tough because people are successful at things and they're like, forget like, oh yeah, I forget other people don't live like that, you know, but on a foundational level, could you share just some basic words of wisdom on a lifestyle component from a lifestyle component that gets people into this higher vibrational energy that you and your mom and very healthy people live on? Okay. I would love to comment on this. So our lives are filled with relationships. And yeah. when I say relationships, mm. I am definitely not just referring to relationships we have with like our mom or our significant mm. other, our children. Like I have a relationship with my laptop that's in front of me. I have mm. a relationship with like my curtains in my apartment. I have a relationship mm. with my uncles that live down the street. I have a relationship mm. with my body. Yeah. Like looking at things like Oh, like our relationship with that. The only reason I said is like the very first thing that came to mind mm -hmm. is like when you first mentioned that was um, I was actually raised between two different households. I had my mom who was super, super health oriented. And then I had my dad and his uh, whole side of the family is um, it's just a different food, completely different food. Not they eat, actually st still eat really healthy, but it's like, it's not like the be yeah. worried about your health all the time type of vibe. Like we would make yeah. food in the morning and literally eat until we went to bed. At night. <laughs> like, yeah. it was a totally different food environment. And so I actually kind of got to, see, I actually feel like I was blessed to develop a really right. healthy relationship with food where I could learn, look at food, like, wow, this is going to nourish my body. Right. This is a super food. Like right. you need to stop being so judgy towards the foods you're eating right. and look at it. Like you have a relationship with food and you have yeah. a relationship with your body. You're like, whoa, like it's, it's becomes fun, you know? And then totally. also it removes a lot of the judgment. We're like, if I'm going to go have a big, huge burger with my dad at a barbecue restaurant yeah. on Saturday, when I go see him for a my cousin's wedding, like there's not going to be any judgment there. It's like, right. oh, this is such a cool burger, dad. Like, that'd yeah. be so much fun. So Love I don't know, just it. for me. Love it. Like, just look, stepping back and looking, like at the end of the day, the biggest, like most comprehensive studies in the world. And I've heard it come down to one of two things. 
people's health comes down to like the and like the health wise it's like how much they walk a day that's a big part but the other the biggest thing that i've seen bottom line is the sense of community and the sense of yeah. relationships that people have in their life like yeah. loneliness is a worse risk factor let me share this statistic with you really quick loneliness is a worse risk factor than um it's worse than smoking it's about smoking 15 cigarettes a day actually wow. is what they've equated to like it, it's it's basically worse than obesity and heart disease and so um, I, I might not have it here to pull up, but all I'm saying is, uh, don't underestimate the relationships in our lives and how, like, it's not so much about doing the things that we're supposed to be doing uh, as opposed yeah. to like, why are we doing them? Like, am I Oof. doing this for my body out of a place of like, do I, am I in a happy place with my body or am I not? And like, what do right. I, do I need to have some, some work done on me with my body with like an emotion code specialist or a therapist, or just some conversations with it, you know, for yeah. me, understanding how my body worked like all relationships in life, the more you understand someone, the more you can love them, right? Yeah. Otherwise you're just making assumptions about why they do that. Oof. If I don't understand why my body is storing adipose tissue, I will hate it for that. I will be like, you just hate me. You're just getting fat on purpose and blah, blah, blah. Cause I don't understand the, the biological mechanism behind why it's right. storing adipose tissue. If I can learn more about my body and understand it from a place of compassion, all of a sudden I'm like right. crying being like, you saved my life. If all of that, those triglycerides yeah. and glucose stayed in my bloodstream. I would have died. It's like, you saved my life, man. Like, right. thank you. And you, you look at your right. fat deposits differently after that. So anyway, I'm just, I know it's kind of extreme, but I'm just saying mm -hmm. like, beautiful. Looking, yeah. Just having that, like taking that attitude of gratitude into the relationships in our life and like yeah. removing some of the judgment instead of it being like, this is good. This is bad. Like there's going to be a time and place for you to drink a green drink for breakfast. And there's going to be a time and place for you to eat a burger with your dad. And like, yeah. and they could be equally healthy for you. Oh, so good healthy for you. Thank you. Thank you. You know yeah. that, uh, I've, I've had to do a lot of deep work because I, I think sometimes health optimization can turn into orthorexia or mm -hmm. if it's not full on orthorexia, it's still this mentality of good, bad thinking, black, white thinking. And if I eat that, that's bad, which means I'm bad, which puts us in this lower vibrational energy, which then makes us want to do all these quote unquote bad things that weren't even bad. And I tell my clients that all the time. I'm like, I eat donuts. Sometimes I eat sweet potato fries at a place that dried them in canola oil. I full well know that, but I'm having fun with my kids and I don't sweat it, you know? Yeah. Um, and most of the time I try to, I, I have that nourishing, like, what do you need body? Here you go. You're going to love this. This is so good for you. And I feel that because I have that positive energy, like some canola oil at the restaurant, it's not going to kill me, you know, but if totally. I sit there and I stress and I stress and I hate myself for it and all I'm eating every bite with a, with an extra side of fear about what it's going to do with my body. Now I'm disconnected from my kids that I'm sitting at the restaurant with. I've just put fear rushing through my body. What's mm -hmm. going to be more detrimental to your health, the canola oil or all that, the disconnection mm -hmm. and the fear. So I love that so much. It's a lot of the deep work I've had to do with clients is like, it's okay. Yeah. It's okay. It's like everything went well, except I totally had chocolate cake on Friday. Oh, wait. So everything went well. Was it good? Did you enjoy it? I yeah. hope you enjoyed it. You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. Um, so I, I, I love, love what you that. said. Cause that's not like the bad, like you ate chocolate. Yeah. Like, why are you not celebrating you ate chocolate cake? You know, yeah. like, that sounds awesome. yeah. now, lucky you. One thing you and I talked about when you came over that we both totally resonate with is like intuitive eating can't be the starting point for a lot of people who are dealing yeah. with intense gut microbiome imbalances right. because they're just going to be craving unhealthy foods all day because right. they're not in control of what they're craving. Totally. It's my favorite thing to tell new clients that are hungry all the time. Right. I'm like, I have amazing news for you. It's not that you lack willpower. It's that your entire apostat is being hijacked by my like candida and unhealthy gut bacteria, right. that you save sugar, but you don't actually like, this is great. Cause if we can get your microbiome and check, you're all of a sudden right. going to have, it's not going to be a struggle anymore. Right. So, anyway, so you right. can't always start off with start there. Yeah. With every person, but you can definitely end there. And then what you said, like some days, like I'll eat perfect for like oh, two weeks straight, just like not even because I'm trying to, just because that's what my body craves. Like I right. love salmon and fish and papayas and and right. like and and potatoes and local grass fed beef and and tons of like local kales and vegetables and and my isogenics protein shakes and all that. And then I'll wake up in the morning and be like, dude, I want donuts so bad right now. And I was like, go buy donuts and eat like three of them. I just don't yeah. feel bad after that. So anyway, Same. I know it sounds extreme, but it's like. It's about radical um, acceptance, definitely. Yeah, definitely. Thank you so much for that. Such a wise answer. Amy, you are awesome. Is the best place for people to find you just through Holistic Health Educators or is there another way people can find you? 
yeah holistic health educators for now i'm okay. gonna be starting my own social media campaign now finally Yay. i've just been really f- focusing on building the school you know i can't be someone yeah. who just like complains about modern health education not yeah. practical information you know just sit yeah. back so i'm really grateful my mom gave me the opportunity to be involved because our school is growing so oh, it's, it's so awesome. And, and you guys will hear from her mom as well. And I'm so excited to dive in because when I first heard your mom speak, I was like, who is this woman? Who is this? Why is she not the most famous health educator in the world? Give her every single microphone. And you are the same way. It is so beautiful. It's like, you're not exactly the same as your mom, obviously. Like you've got definitely got your own wisdom and your own value and things to share, but you guys both vibrate on this energy that is not only incredibly educated, but is able to put these things in a very easy way for people to understand, break it down. I mean, you're doing the, per- you're like totally in alignment with your purpose and, and and, and continuing to educate yourselves and share, educate and share, but you have this gift for being able to, to share it in this really tangible, really our digestible way, you know? So it's, it's awesome. Thank you so much cool. for coming Thank on you, and Sarah. sharing with us today. And, um, I'm going to be thinking about my relationship with my laptop and my microphone <laughs> and my phone. <laughs> okay, that one, I was like my curtains. I was like, where did that? I was like, I don't ever I love it. <laughs> I love it. But it's, 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 uh, it's, it's love. It's, um, appreciation, gratitude, um, connection, you know? is what you're saying is so important for health. So yeah. Thank you for standing as an example. I cannot wait to just see you grow. You got to do the social media girl because like, like just even little 60, 60 second videos or you have just, you're just this fountain of knowledge. So we got to get it out there. So I'll I'll be pushing your butt on that. I'm so happy. I'm young right now. I gotta feel like I'm about 80, like not 80, but like, so I'm just like happy. I get the rest of my life in front of me to see this play out in America and across the world. Everyone totally. has the same problems. We think America has only is the only country with a problem. We're not. We're not. Right. Like right. every country is dealing with the same stuff. I yep. guarantee it. So yep. I'm just saying like we're except Taiwan's got a lot there. If we were having a separate call about true integrative medicine, Taiwan hospitals have chiropractors and herbal pharmacies wow. and massage therapists wow. in their hospitals. I love Taiwan. So we should have a wow. separate call about their integrative medical their integrative medicine. Um, okay. See, and this is why, we, this is why you got to grow your social. Cause you have so much goodness to share, you know, <laughs> just show, tell us, Amy, tell us. Okay. All right. Okay. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you so much. Pleasure <laughs> speaking with you and I'll talk to you again Likewise. soon. Likewise. Thanks girl. Bye-bye.